station. Um, you may be aware that the last two deep pit coal mines are about to be closed down. And um, when they were privatised, Anne Scargill predicted that health and safety, accidents and death, uh, would increase dramatically under privatisation, and they did. And just one other general point is that privatisation sets worker against worker. Yeah. And the reason that the pickets suffered so terribly at Augury was because the lorry drivers were no longer unionised. They had been in 1974. They backed the pickets. Under Thatcher, they were no longer unionised. They were happy to cash in on the huge amounts that Thatcher was giving them to transport the coke. And this did for the pickets. And privatisation is insidious, it's evil, it sets worker against worker and we have to fight it. Mm -hmm. Well, I completely agree with that. And I think that that goes hand in hand with the anti-union laws because outsourcing means that workers who are delivering the same service, sometimes working in the same building, are employed by different employers. I mean, people who've been at conference will know we have called our members at Lambeth College out on strike. We had two days of strike action last week, three days coming up next week. But the security staff, for example, who actually unlock the building, they don't work for the college because they've been outsourced. So even though some of them are union members, we can't call them out on strike. We can't lawfully call them out on strike because we have the most restrictive labour legislation of any advanced capitalist country mm -hmm. in the Western world. So that's one of the reasons why privatisation is a problem. Uh, I just comment on the fact that, yes, it's deplorable we have people in the Labour Party who are, in fact, in favour of privatisation. And I think it was, I think I remember Kelvin Hopkins MP saying a few years ago at a meeting I was at, that it used to be in the Labour Party, you knew where you were, because you had the socialists on the left and the social democrats on the right. Yeah. And we'd have an argument, and we'd disagree with one another, but we were all on the same side. And then suddenly, you've got all these neoliberals in the Labour Party, and then they were running the Labour Party. Uh, and to some extent they still are. Um, uh, and I'm a member in Brighton and Hope, and I can look at the leadership of our Labour group and worry about that. Uh, and on the question of mutualisation, I'm the branch secretary of Unison in Lambeth Local Government Branch. Lambeth Council was the first cooperative council. And I can tell you that mutualisation of public services does not work. It does not achieve anything. We, in all these years of being a cooperative council, and we're into our fourth or fifth year now, two or three tiny little mutuals have been created. In fact, what this has meant, they, they, they no longer call themselves a cooperative council, they call themselves a cooperative commissioning council. And that turns out to be the same thing as the commissioning council, which is all about just letting contracts for the delivery of public services. So we mustn't fall for that. It's, a, it's an attempt. The, the mutualisation, the cooperative council idea is simply an attempt to sell privatisation to us. And so who, who is there who, who's you know, on our side trying to stop selling privatisation? Well, Red Labour is part of it, and um, I think the use of social media by Red Labour and others is very important. Mm -hmm. um, in Brighton and Hope Labour Party, we have a, a Labour Party Facebook group, which is often used by the advocates of right-wing policies within the party. And we need to get out there and advocate for socialism because there is a lot of support for basic socialist policies amongst rank and file Labour Party members. We're still probably the majority of party members in many areas of the country supporting essentially what are socialist policies. But we've allowed the leadership of our party at every level to fall into other hands. And I think part of what happened, and this happened to a large extent under New Labour, was the shift to the cabinet system of governance in local authorities. And I think why they did that is that the Blairites knew they couldn't trust enough Labour councillors. So if you had a Labour council with like 30 or 40 Labour councillors, they knew there were only about a dozen of them who they would invite to a dinner party. <coughs> and so they, they set up a cabinet system so that those dozen could run the council and the working class councillors could just be their lobby fodder and they might be allowed to sit on scrutiny committees to keep them happy. Um, and that's the problem we have with local government at the moment. And I think the LRC, we ran smack bang into that problem over the last year, because at last year's conference, we were pushing councillors against the cuts. And we were right to do that. And I'm really proud of those very small number of Labour councillors in councils where there are Labour authorities who voted resolutely against cuts. That's, you know, 
I like to think that's what I would have done if I'd been there with them. But we have seen people being disciplined and expelled from the party. And we've got no choice but to reflect on that um, and to consider what we do next. Because there's not an awful lot of point in us taking, taking the very best socialist councillors we've got and hurling them at a brick wall mm. so that they get expelled. Um, it might please a few people. I mean, it might, it might, it might feel nicer, quite honestly, for the individuals concerned. And maybe that's what people should do. But I think, I think we need a debate about what we do next, given what we've seen happen. And I'll finish on this. I think the problem we have is to do with the nature of Labourism in this country and to do with the way in which, historically, we've allowed there to be a divide between the industrial wing and the political wing of our movement. And the trade unions have never been sufficiently assertive about politics. Because from a very, very long time ago, there was this division of labour where we, the trade unions, we do workplace organising, and you, the labour politicians, you know, you run the councils, you get elected to government or whatever. And we, the trade unions, have not asserted ourselves sufficiently. And we didn't do that about the anti-trade union laws, we haven't done it about privatisation, and we quite plainly haven't done it about councillors against the cuts. Because a few of our councillors who were against the cuts, after our decision at local government conference last year, <coughs> met with some of our national officers in unison, in local government, and our national officers told them that unison did not support an anti-cuts position. Now, I don't know when any of our conferences ever took that decision. I'm not saying we took a clear decision that we did support an anti cuts position, because we've never been allowed to discuss it, but it would, would have put us in legal jeopardy. <laughs> but I don't remember us ever taking a positive decision that we thought it was a good idea that Labour councillors should make cuts. But that's why our national officers told the councillors who were brave enough to stand against the cuts. So I think, mm. I believe, I continue to believe, and I'm older than <coughs> some on this platform, but I haven't lost my optimism in the world, and I continue to believe that the Labour Party into a vehicle for socialist progress. But I think if we're going to do it, somehow we have to overcome that pernicious effect of the split between the, the industrial and political wings of our movement. And the industrial wing of our movement, with our six million members, we need to assert ourselves politically somehow. Thanks. I'm just going to pick up a bit to the two of the questions. In terms of what's by confidence in Labour opposing Privatisation. The honest answer is I don't know. Honest, I, I, I don't know what, what, Labour, what Labour's plans will, will be. What I think I do know is that um, winning elections and winning power focuses the mind. And I think it is going to be very hard for Labour in 2015 to win the general election unless they move to, to the left. So I, I think that mm. is going to have an effect on Labour's uh, policy in terms of privatisation. Yes, I said earlier, earlier on that um, there's no harm, certainly at times, in, in doing popular things. There was a... I was pleased when Miliband came out and said he was going to freeze energy prices for two years. But I, I, I don't think that's, that's going far enough. I think you should nationalise the big city energy companies. Um, and I think that's a, a popular thing to do. There was an opinion poll four months ago by YouGov that said 52% of people YouGov interviewed supported nationalisation of the big six energy companies. Now a lot of people might think, well, 52%, that's really, really quite the balance, you know, is that, going to, is that going to make the Labour Party move to the left in terms of nationalising the energy companies? The fact is that the people you got polled are Tory voters. 52% of Tory voters are now in, are now in favour of nationalising yeah. the big six energy companies. Yeah. It's always you know, just think how bad these companies must be and how they've ripped off the, the public and how they've abused their power that majority of Tory voters are actually in favour of nationalising the big six energy companies. 
So I think it would be a hugely positive and a hugely electoral vote, vote winning exercise for Labour to come out and support the nationalising of exit handcuffs. The same with nationalising the railways. Mm -hmm. uh, and could, could it be done? Could it be done financially? Of course it could. You don't actually have to do anything in terms of railways. You just, you just, you just wait the franchise runs out. In terms of uh, the energy companies, could that be paid? You could buy, if you actually paid the face value, the stock market value, you, you could buy the big six energy companies, lock, stock and barrel, just by one act. And that's for scrap and try. Scrap try, you don't renew it, make you seven billion pounds saved immediately and go back to the next eight years. So I, I think there is a, a real opportunity uh, for, for, for Labour there. I mean, we've, we've, seen in, we've seen in Scotland, uh, in terms of Labour Party, do, do I think the Scottish Labour Party are far to the left of uh, the UK Labour Party? No, I don't. What I think is that the Scottish voter is to the, is to the left. And I think, disappointingly, it takes me on to uh, the, the, the second question about relationships with uh, other left-wing parties in the UK. There is no other left-wing party in England to have a political relationship with. That's a that's, that's simple fact. There has been no left-wing Labour Party other than the Labour Party since 1945 in England. What disappointing there is, is there are some right-wing alternative parties to the Tory party, yeah. whether it's been the National Front, whether it's been the BNP, whether, whether it's been you, you can, you know, you know, If you're ever going to do well in, a, in an election in England, as, as one of the, I don't mean the word uh, pejoratively, but one of the French parties, you do well in a European election. Now we saw some very positive and welcome gains from, from the left, such as Sarice in, in, in Greece. You know, there was, you know, the left wing alternative to Labour in England could break 1% yeah, sure. in, a Euro, in a European election. There is no, you know, no, no matter how much I want Labour to move to the left in England, the fact is that currently there is no left wing alternative to, 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 Labour, to Labour in England. What the Labour Party need to do is to turn out the vote of people who would support Labour. Um, <coughs> too long the, the mantra in England, be, in England has been vote Labour not quite as far as the Tories. That, that does not win your elections. You have to give people a positive reason for coming out and voting Labour and a positive reason as 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 usually uh, public public says. So my very last point, I actually have some some sympathy for some of the, the, the Labour Labour councils. First of all, I think it's ridiculous the discipline that's placed on councillors uh, as compared to MPs. You know, M MPs, you know, there's almost nothing the party will do to discipline them. But a Labour councillor can be threatened to expulsion from, 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 the, from the party simply, simply for breaking the whip. I think it is very hard, however, currently for councillors when they have got very limited control over, uh, over raising budgets. So I think there are, there, there are issues that we need, that we need to, to look at there. The one other thing that I think we need to do is that we need slightly, uh, same point as John, but slight, slightly different in the sense that we need to get back to good working relationships between individual party members and the CLPs and, and the trade unions. You know, for too long we've always managed to divide ourselves. The parties done it very effectively by buying one, one section of the party off Again, against them. We need to start having a naked front and actually see, see it through to the end. So, I've been a party member since I was 15, which I can assure people, and I'm sure, unfortunately, people will believe me, was the yesterday when I was 15. But uh, the first time I, I don't have a positive outlook, then I would have stayed in the party till I die, but I may not be as active, but I'm still confident that we can keep. Uh, I forgot a pen, so I don't remember all the points that I made. But um, the like the one five one was like um, I did remember was um, like how good is Labour? How can you know if you made better? I think we have a similar problem with our Brighton council that we seem to have 
um, where the leaders are much righter wing, it seems to be, than um, lots of the kind of grassroots members from Brighton. And I think that might be a problem. It's a problem in the Labour Party as a whole, and I think in lots of councils where um, it's the more righter wing people who are there, because I think generally it's easier for the people who are more right wing to be party politicians, uh, no, not party politicians, um, like professional, that's it, professional politicians, and to afford to do all that stuff. Um, so it's easier for them to get into the positions of power. Um, and I think if we can get more left wing people into those higher positions of power, and then if they can, if we can say get a, two or three bigger councils as, as left-wing councils, then they can stand up to the government if they need to over their budgets and that type of thing. And if you have a whole council who's saying, we're not going to do this, then I think the Labour Party would find it much harder to expel an entire council of Labour um, councillors. Yeah. Thanks, Claire. <coughs> Three points I want to focus on. Yeah, these are my closing remarks as well, that's like a minute or two, okay. Uh, on the TTIP, which is totally said is a transatlantic trade agreement, uh, I had an interesting discussion with Paul Novak from the TUC, as Assistant General Secretary, uh, yesterday he came to address the General Federation of Trade Unions Executive, and <clears throat> this is quite a big issue within the TUC because all of us would welcome agreements that create jobs, bring prosperity, and secure people's futures. Uh, unfortunately, everything I've seen in the TTIP doesn't kind of do that because it is very much uh, an issue of the multinationals uh, finding a way to stymie the, the legal and lawful and democratic activities of the, uh, of the government of the day. So it's one that needs watching and an issue that I think the left needs to wise up on uh, quite seriously, just as it does in Europe. And I'll come to that in a moment. <coughs> <coughs> another, another topic that came up was mutualisation. Well, I've got two comrades here from the Kent, Surrey, Sussex uh, probation area. And Chris Grading, in his efforts to privatise probation, didn't allow an in house bid, much as we despise the whole process anyway. At least give us an opportunity to, to, to show what we can do on, on the so called level playing field. But he didn't do that. He went around touting the idea of mutualisation, where groups of staff could uh, band it together and, and make a bid, and, and colleagues in the area did just that and put a lot of heart and soul into it. And uh, they pulled out of the process just last week, uh, citing commercial and operational restrictions. What we know of him is that was a con as well. It's all about just, if you like, a bit of tokenism to say, well, you can have a go, and you might just get a couple of these mutuals through somewhere. And that would prove his point. But it's a walking contract. And all the evidence about mutualisation uh, in thriving public sector areas indicates, as John has said, that it fails. There are some good examples of mutualisation. Um, some of you may have heard of the Benefit Healthcare Society, which puts all of its profits straight back in the benefit of the subscribing members, and it works pretty well. They're not without their problems, but as a model, it's a lot better than, than most I've seen. I want to just focus on the main point how to win, because that was the thing coming through, how to win the arguments. And yet again, we see an election process in Europe and in, this, uh, in the UK that has seen a massive total of one third of the electorate that can be asked to do anything about democracy. Two thirds are more interested in what's on Facebook, Big Brother, The X Factor, or whatever it is that they find more interesting. Or for whatever reason, they've become disenfranchised. And it's, that's the target area where, of course, all the parties now see the, the golden goose, as it were, and UKIP, to an extent, because their anti-political uh, draw has managed to cash in on a portion of that. But I think they can be defeated. And quite simply, people tonight talked about the gains you've made locally. Schools, for example. Uh, I know in Hammersmith, uh, you've made gains there. Uh, health closures. Issues that matter to the electorate prepared to be engaged or prepared to engage with are things that will see you through. Privatisation, jobs in Europe, inextricably linked, Europe's other area.
Let's see if Bob Crow might not have agreed with this line on Europe, but it was one of the only few on the left that actually posit the view is this quite giving us what we want, comrades? What's what we signed up for? Let's have the debate. And I think we need to, again, to, to get in, engaged in that debate mm. and talk about what Europe can bring in terms of jobs and benefits. For sure, I'd agree there's waste out there. <coughs> it needs to be look. Uh, I don't disagree with Cameron. <coughs> Seriously, that we need to renegotiate our place. It's your money and my money, sure enough, the wastefulness that does go on and, and clouds the really good work that the EC does in terms of job creation and funding. We need to get that message across. And finally, taxation. We haven't had time to talk about it tonight. It's always the same, isn't it? Come on, election, how much are you going to put in a higher rate of income tax? 50p or 40p. Well, stuff that. Actually, what about £121 billion at any 12 month period is outstanding in evading and avoiding company corporate taxation? You know, it seems you know, if you dodge your tax as an individual, it's okay. If you scrounge you know, benefits, as, as the popular media portray, that's not okay. The people that are getting through, who've been out of work for ages, have no other means of putting food on the, on the table than to work the system. What else would they do? People who earn a lot of money and the companies have a choice. They should pay their share, pay a fair wage to people, and come clean about where they stand. Mm. Regenerate the electorate, give them confidence that actually something is changing. If we do that, we can make that difference.